Hello and welcome everyone to this Talks at Google event in partnership with Ola, Google's Latinx and Hispanic Employee Resource Group as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. My name is Maria del Recoichea and I'm a Product Area Manager for Google Ads Policy. Today I'm beyond excited to host an amazing Latina who made it big in the fashion industry. From her very own Chile to New York City, where she has established her business, Zero and Maria Cornejo. Maria is a champion of women in the fashion industry and beyond. Responsible design and sustainable practices have been at the core of Zero since she opened it in 1998. Maria is a founding member of the Council of Fashion Designers of America Sustainability Committee, and her innovative work has been recognized with awards from the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, CFDA Lexus Fashion Initiative, and the Fashion Group International. In 2019, Maria was appointed to the CFDA Board of Directors by its chairman, Tom Ford. Her personal approach has gained zero a devoted following of incredible women, including the likes of Tilda Swinton, Christy Tarlington Burns, and First Lady Michelle Obama. What an honor to have you here with us today, Maria. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Of course. I wanted to talk to you today about your legacy, present, and future, since this is our Hispanic Heritage Month team at Google this year. So let me start by mentioning that you moved to the UK when you were 12. So can you tell us more about those early days in your life and how those circumstances shaped who you are today and your business? Uh, yes, my parents left Chile in, after September the 11th, 1973. Um, and so we became first, we went first to Peru, got taken there by the United Nations and then to England, we became political refugees. So. Yeah, I mean, I've lived in Chile and South America less than I've lived in New York or London or Paris. So, well, actually, no, Paris, I only lived there for nine years. But, you know, I feel a bit, little bit of a, a mutt. <laughs> but I feel like with everything uh, that I take away, it's just my sense of color. And, you know, I'm, I feel like whenever I, things come up, I'm, I'm quite flexible because I've had to be there. And, you know, I've been on survival mode since I was 11. So you sort of turn not to sweat the small stuff. Certainly, um, and that's something that I'm sure resonates with a lot of our audience today. Um, how do you think your today would be different if that hadn't happened, if your parents hadn't left Chile at, at, the, at your age of 12? Oh God, my life would be so different. I, I, to be quite honest, I'm quite an introvert. And I, yes, I did make clothes with my grandmother when I was a child, but I didn't think it was possible to be a fashion designer. And I was super shy. And, and sadly, and also because of my mother died when I was 14, it sort of pushed me out of my own shell and had to sort of learn how to be a little bit more out there than I would have liked to have been, you know, because I was terribly shy when I was little. And tell us more about those early days. How did you first uh, get interested in fashion and on uh, upcycled material? Um, well, as a child in fashion, because of my mom and my aunts who had amazing style, and my grandmother was always making things, knitting or whatever, so she taught me how to sew and how to knit on giant nails so you know my interest was in making things i didn't realize that you could be a fashion designer then when i moved to england and you know i was 12 by then i spent a year in peru i moved to england at 12. i couldn't speak a word of english so what, the things that i was doing well in was art were art languages and chemistry and I didn't have the confidence to do chemistry because I kept saying to my teacher, I think I have the wrong answer. And he said, no, 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 you have it. And I said, no, 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 it's wrong. And I sort of, so because of that, I focused more on the arts and the languages because I thought that would, you know, in England, you have to choose your, your, 
perfect vocation at 15 you have to sh choose your way you know what you either go into mathematics and sciences or you go into the arts and languages so i thought for me it was easy to go into the arts and languages but as i get older i realize that i use all these sides of me that i didn't realize my strengths whether it was doing maths in my head or geometry in my head now they come up in the way that i cut or i read some things i'm quite practical so it's, it's interesting to know that, you know, at the time I didn't have the confidence, but maybe I could have done chemistry. Maybe I would have been doing something else. Maybe. And, and tell us maybe how... Google or something. I could be coding or something. <laughs> yeah, certainly. And tell us more about how you first got introduced into sustainable fashion, upcycle materials, how you know when was if you remember the moment when you thought this is my thing in fashion like i i want to go deep here so tell us more about that um i think for me is when i moved to new york and mm -hmm. i started figuring out that i wanted to be based in one place and working with different bigger companies and traveling around the world and seeing how much waste there was and how much you know I just didn't agree with it. You know, I would be working for a big company and they would fly me to Hong Kong and on business class. And then the owner of the company will be nickel and diming a, a guy over a sweater for a dollar. And meanwhile, we're spending $10,000 or in a hotel room, you know, on flights. So, and it just didn't make sense to me to also send things halfway across the world. But when it really clicked for me was when I opened my own space, a creative space and having children and really, you know, realizing how much waste there is and what we leave behind and having children. I wanted something healthy for my kids, you know, to, you know, it's, it's the planet that we're leaving for them. So it's just how do we do that correctly? And I think for me, it was really having children that made the big the click and opening the store in New York. So then I started by working, you know, finding uh, jobbers, upcycling fabrics, working with denim, you know, finding places that would sell leftover fabrics, not ordering anything from scratch, using things that were already there, you know, working also with fleas from, you know, things that Patagonia used, which are made out of recycled plastic bottles and things like that. And for me, it's a constant, you know, every season is a challenge. How do we make the collection more and more sustainable? Thank you for sharing all that. Um, tell us more about how you manage then to build the business anchoring on that concept of uh, sustainable fashion and how you managed to create a team um, who felt um, identi who identified, you know, with uh, what you want your business to represent. Well, I think for me, building a team comes from the fact that I'm pretty much here all the time, you know. I think exceptionally recently I haven't been here very often because I've been having moving house and stuff, but I'm sort of part of the furniture, really. So <laughs> it's like, uh, it's just by example and actually talking about it and, you know, pointing things out. Like I was saying, it's no point using something uh, eco if we're flying it halfway across the world and then we're shipping it somewhere else to be made. I, you know, the whole point about... Uh, manufacturing locally is having a smaller carbon print and also knowing who made your clothes and that is a luxury in this day and age um, you know we have a program of things that we do like in Bolivia but that is because the alpaca is Bolivia we work with a women's co-op I ask every knitter to sign every piece so they take pride in their work. And these are indigenous women who actually use their money to survive and put their children to school. So I think it's it's being conscious on every level. And, you know, sometimes, you know, like I said, is it better to buy a recycled fabric and you're flying it halfway across the world? Or do you use something that's already in your stock and you, you just use that and you don't ship it? It's just constant, like, reassessing. Uh, you know, what's the best solution and minimizing the processes. So tell me more about the global fashion industry and how do you feel about brands who have taken a completely different approach to yours? How do I feel? Uh, well, 
I I am shocked and horrified that given what's going on right now, people are not making better choices. Uh, I think I'm always, you know, it's about cause and effect. You know, we have to be responsible for our own actions. And, you know, even on, on Thursday, I was flying to Houston and I was, I had a six and a half hour delay because of the weather. There's flooding again. You know, we had major floods in New York last month. If people don't wake up and stop and get off their high pedal zone and really realize that it affects people, especially lower income people, because they're the ones that live in basements, they're the ones that don't have the resources to live on a mountain. Do you know what I mean? I think that's the reality. I think people, we have to be the, the idea of kinship and that we're responsible not just for ourselves, but people in our environment is just to me it's disgusting i cannot understand how people cannot take responsibility and just wash their hands of it like it doesn't occur sorry i'm getting a little bit <laughs> no you're, you're totally fine um so i understand that you are extremely committed to local manufacturing to upcycle mm -hmm. materials uh you are describing how you you feel so strongly about it that you know it's our responsibility so tell me more about some of the trade-offs because i'm sure like some brands would love maybe to follow your steps but there are challenges so i, I wanted you to share with us what are the challenges that you face because of these commitments that you made for your business Use all our denim in New York is eco denim. Uh, it's not cheap. You know, I would love it to be cheaper so we could sell it to a younger audience. Um, I think that's the reality. So the, there are more limited runs because also the audience becomes more niche because of the price point. Uh, you know, and you look at things uh, in, you know, who made your clothes and you see designer clothes sometimes that are really reasonably priced but when you start looking at the labels they're investing in they're doing really big runs they're doing them god knows where and so it is a trade-off you know as a business we we can only grow a certain amount and at the same time it's maybe it's mm -hmm. good i mean for me it's it's actually buy less buy better and, and get back to the notion that we used to have when we were kids that, you know, you saved up for something special and you didn't buy everything every week and you didn't buy it because it was cheap. You bought it because it was beautifully made and there's craft in it and the fabrics are amazing. And I think we need to get back to that. What about on your pricing strategy? Is it challenging as well there, like on, on how... Because you're saying that there are costs associated, right? So tell us more about what's been your approach to your pricing strategy. Well, we, you know, the, the margins on the things that are made in New York are not like some of the companies' margins that, that the people made somewhere else, you know? And so it, it, it is a challenge constantly to how do we make this available? How do we survive as a business because part of being sustainable is also surviving as a business. So, and there's so many areas of sustainability, you know, like the UN has, I think it's 16 different areas that you, you know, we're meant to be sustainable. It's not just about the human cost, it's about water, it's about location, it's about um, wages. It's, it, there's so many different layers involved. And I always say to people, it's like, we have to try and do our best and try and reach that however best we can, you know? But it's not easy. It's not easy. And I mean, definitely as a, we're classed as more a, a luxury company uh, because of the pricing. But, you know, I think, I think the cheapest thing we have in the collection is $295. Would you... Um... Would you try and see if because it's it's luxury for for yes. some people when when they look at those uh, price tags? Yes. Do you think there is a way in your business with your business model 
to bring this to more people at a at more affordable prices? Is that possible with, with today's, you know, with the current uh, status? I think I think it would be possible if we had, say, if we were selling in South America, we would produce it in South America, so the prices would go down. We would produce locally, vertically, like you know, with the Bolivians, we produce the alpaca net. So if we did the denim in Peru or in mm -hmm. Chile or Mexico, yes, it would be possible if we had a bigger audience there, and then you could bring down the prices that way by doing things more vertically. Same with the shoes, you know. I think it's, um, but it it's a, it's um, it's so like chicken and the egg because you need to have the quantities to start doing things. Then you need to have the exposure, and and one of the other things is not having, not being an. I don't know if people know this, but if you're not an advertiser, you don't get any press. Really, it's very hard to have press. So we rely a lot of from the word of mouth and, you know, collaborations and the good faith of certain press people that will, you know, you know, like Nina Garcia just did a whole issue on Latin designers, which was great. Uh, but the press usually just features either flavor of the month or the mega advertisers, you know, so it's, it's hard to reach a wider audience. That's yeah. why I'm talking to you guys at Google, you know? Yeah, and, and you were saying earlier as well that part of the commitment is to survive. So um, I was uh, wondering about how COVID-19 has treated you and the business. So can you tell us uh, what's been going on since COVID started uh, in, and how it's hit your business? Well, you know, if you'd asked me last May 2020, I would have said we're going out of business, to be honest, because our business, we did Paris in March, and both I and my business partner both got COVID and a few other members of the team, and then we got shut down. So we were really shut down until July from March, and we lost all the big stores, you know, canceled their orders, it was tragic. It was really tragic. And if it hadn't been for the PPP loans with the government and the, the you know the business, it wouldn't have survived. But you know we've seen a big comeback now. And I've just been on a trunk show in Houston. My business partner's doing the whole area right now, and people are coming back. And you know we also have a lot of loyal customers. And one of the things, even through the, I mean, I'm saying, you know, we've been through so many things now. It's like this, the survival instinct in New York is pretty high. <laughs> I remember after the, you know, 9-11, there was a recession. Then we had 2008, you know, it's like how many things we've gone through here. And one of the things that I, we've survived before because we have a very loyal clientele and, one of the things that they respect is the fact that we're made locally. So it, it really I keep Maria, can you hear me? I can hear you now, but you were uh, frozen there for a little oh. bit. I don't know what's going on. We're not very good on technology here. Maybe we should <laughs> go to the office. No, don't worry. Don't worry at all. You're totally okay. I was uh, wondering if you could walk us through the experience your customers have when you go into your store. Oh, I wish I could walk you through the store right now, actually. I should have done a film or something. But um, no, our store is really lovely. Uh, we actually, last February, instead of doing a show, we decided to remodel the store so we could have more events and then COVID hit. So basically the store is really warm and beautiful. And I hate shopping just to preface why, because I hate shopping. So I always say to the girls, make everybody comfortable, you know, and then people might come back. I think, oh, they can't, oh, they buy. If you're comfortable enough to try things on, it's quite a, 
personal experience you know, to sort of try things on and have some stranger looking at you. So I always feel like we should, you know, make people feel as comfortable as possible. We have a tree in the store that's been there since right at the beginning. It's been there for like 24 years. It used to be in the original store. It's a famous tree that my ex-husband photographed, Mark Borthwick, and the actual tree is still there and it's thriving. Um, and the collection, you know, right now we have full winter in the store. So. And yes, I can hear you now. Um, so tell us about, you know, how do people leave this store? Um, what is the average customer like when they leave? Um, I I think we, we have, a, I mean, I get the end of day reports just because I want to see who came in, who tried things. People usually leave and they're surprisingly converted because they realize that the clothes are really flattering. And so they, it makes them, I mean, my main goal as a woman is to make women feel good about themselves, not make them feel like they're too heavy, too skinny, too tall, too old. I, I like the idea of ageless, even though, I've aged like in the last 24 years. I think in my head, I'm still young. You know, I just catch myself in the mirror and I look different. But I think um, as women, we, we need to give ourselves that break and just to give us confidence. You know, I think one of the nicest compliments people pay to me is that they say, oh, my God, I got that and I, I wore that and I got the job, you know. I even remember, you know, some client coming in and saying, my goodness, I was wearing this dress at the White House and Michelle Obama came straight up to me and she said, I have that dress. And that, you know, I think it's just, it's like a tribe. Like Cindy Sherman wears the clothes. She has a big collection. Apparently, she never told me she had a collection, but she told Vogue that she had 200 pieces in her wardrobe like five years ago. So God knows how many she has. <laughs> wow. Wow. So it's nice because we have all these women who are either super moms, I call them, the ones that actually stay at home and look after the children and do all that, which takes a lot of guts to do that, especially give, during COVID, to teach your kids and to feed them and educate them. I mean, I'm sorry, I took my hat off to those women. They had it the toughest of anybody. So we have the super moms, and then we have artists, we have lawyers, we have actresses, we have all sorts, architects. We have a, a really diverse community of women sort of find themselves within the clothes and, and that, you know it becomes about them how they feel in the clothes rather than me or the designer or acting i always said i never wanted people to be a sandwich board for a designer i don't like branding i think there's nothing worse than advertising for somebody once you've spent a thousand dollars that you're also advertising for them <laughs> and do you do you have any activism going on on your store where you pitch your customers about sustainable fashion? Do you, um, does your personal explain them why the, you know, pieces they're taking home with them are so special? Yes. I mean, every piece has a tag mm -hmm. explaining what's sustainable about it mm -hmm. and has a story attached to it on the, on the tags. Uh, whether it's a network or a print or where it came from, the inspiration, the tags every season get renewed, depending on what fabrics are going into the collection. And that's part of also the the stores, you know, the girls in the store, the team to pass on the message. And tell us more about Chile and how other Chile and also other places in Latin America inspire your designs or maybe don't inspire your designs? You know, Chile is weird because for me, I have such a, um, I left when I was 11, I've been back. And I think one of the things that I realized from Chile, you know, and South America or, or even Mexico, I love Mexico. I think Mexico to me, I love because it makes me think it's like being Latin without actually being Latin. <laughs> <laughs> I can own it but not have to own it sort of thing. In Chile I always feel a little bit like a tourist because one I didn't I left when I was eleven. 
So I'm not aware of the slang or the subtleties of the humor anymore. I'm more in tune with English humor or French or American because I, I speak, you know, I lived in France. My daughter was born in France. I lived in England. I went to school in England. And, you know, on my whole education, secondary education was in English, in England, and my art school. So I always feel really dumb in Spanish because I feel like I don't speak correctly or I don't say the right thing or I'm not Latin enough. You know, people like look at me like, okay, she's like a gringa, but not really. <laughs> I'm sure um, that a lot of people, um, you know, resonate with uh, what you're saying in our yeah. community. There is a lot of people who left their countries in Latin America very young or who might not even have been born in Latin America, but their families uh, identify as uh, Latin Americans or Hispanic. Um, so, and you know what's really like recently, we just have a piece of the Met for the exhibition and they were asking what my nationality was. And I said, well, I'm American, but I was born in Chile. And, you know, because they were trying to figure out where to put me. And I said, but I actually got, you know, I, I learned to be a fashion designer. I went to school in England. So it's really hard to sort of know where you fit. Uh, you always have that feeling that you, you belong, but you don't quite belong. It's, it's sort of that, that immigrant thing that, you know, if I'm, if, if I'm here and I talk to a bunch of Latin people, I feel very Latin. If I go to Chile, I feel very English, that I don't get it. Um, and in England, they look at me and they go, oh, she has an English accent. Here, people don't quite get my accent. <laughs> you know, and, and in French, the same thing, you know, I'm, I love speaking French, but I'm not French. My My daughter was born there, my mother-in-law was French, you know, and I have close friends. But I think as far as design influences through Latin America, I think the geometry, a lot of the poncho shapes, you know, I think also color has been really influential. Um, and architecture, you know, a lot of people say to me, did you do architecture before you did fashion? I said, no. And, and like I said before, with my education, I did, and, You'll see at the end of the presentation, but I started, uh, when I started the store, I wanted to get back, figure out a way of cutting that just belonged to me to make it interesting because I was bored with the fashion business after working for big companies and doing it for a while. So I went back to literally just for geometric shapes and, you know, the, the circle, the triangle, the square, the rectangle, and basically cutting them and putting them on a body and seeing how they would drape on a woman's body. And that was the beginning of zero, right at the beginning. So it's just interesting how all these things come to play. And I think the sense of, you know, in South America, there's, a, there's, there's amazing architecture, whether it's in Mexico, in Chile. I mean, Chile architecture right now is on fire. And, you know, and, and so I think that all those things sort of influence me, or maybe it's just the shorthand that we have with color and shape. And how do you feel today when you reflect on this journey um, and you look back at your early days when you started experimenting, when you started making all these decisions of what you wanted your future to become? It's impressive. So how, how do you reflect on, you know, your success today when you look back? Oh my God, you know, I was too busy just doing. I never really had a, a, a master plan, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe five years ago, I thought, okay, we should be doing this. But on the whole, it was very much based on creativity. And as you know, what I wanted to have in New York was an atelier to have a creative space. And I think people responded to that. And I think the beginning was very much, I didn't even want to wholesale because I was totally of the whole fashion business and for me it was more about just putting things that i was passionate about and seeing the reason it was called series that i wanted people to buy things or appeal to them but it wouldn't be about my history or me it would be more about nothing it would just be as a product what it would look like on them 
and sort of it's sort of interesting that it's become uh the older i get that people you know it's like the more people want to be they want to know more about me or my personal life and things like that and but originally that was not my intention you, you know? don't want to have the attention on you uh, for no. you is the women you dress your designs yeah for me what's really exciting whenever i meet women i i really feel like i should microchip the clothes because they have the most interesting life <laughs> And when I meet a client, whether it's a, you know, like a, a, in Austin, I met a, a surgeon or a lawyer or, you know, Michelle Obama or Tilda Swin. I mean, I just wish the clothes could talk because they would, the, the women are so much more interesting than I am. So that's why I always say, let's be cool by association because, you know, they are, there's like the, the clothes are, are, are being seen and giving these women confidence or being part of their vocabulary when they're doing amazing things. So to me, that is so special. And I'm, I'm sure that's how they feel about you too. Um, so why don't we change gears a little bit and you show us something of what you're working on right now, you know, some of your collection and you explain us your designs. Um, I, I would love to see what is uh, keeping you excited right now. Okay. We'll show you, this is a slideshow. Uh, that Haley created and it's basically from the beginning I mean right now we just launched spring summer 2022 for wholesale so you get a sneak peek this will be in the stores next January February and um, this is the first image this is a special uh, we shot this at the on the roof of the Navy Yard archives on a hundred degree weather so <laughs> wow so we were trying to stay in the shade and you'll see, I mean, that was the idea as well to have shadows, but it ended up being more than that because literally it was so hot that we we're all melting. So this skirt is a wrap skirt made in Santec, special Japanese fabric, and it's has a closure of Velcro because I love the idea of things being adjustable and not mm -hmm. being about a specific size. So a lot of our clothes are very adjustable around the waist. They have either elastic on the back or they have a, a, a belt to tighten it because I feel like women change shapes and sizes every year, every month, basically, every two weeks or three weeks. I mean, we all change so much. So I'm going through. And so the collection is luxury fashion with a conscience, designed and produced in New York by women for women. And I think that's really important to emphasize because um, as a woman, I've always wanted women to feel good about themselves, you know? And this picture is when I first opened the store. So this is 1998 and that's very young me. <laughs> and uh, I was, I think I was 35, so 24 years ago. I'm gonna be 59 next week, next month. Oh. Yes. <laughs> And actually, like the skirt I'm wearing and the top, actually, the top you see in the window, the armor top, we just did a re-release on that and it's doing really well in the collection. Um, so I'm just, um, should I read what it says or do you guys want to read it for yourselves? I think it's better you guys read it. So, so all this was denim. The white was denim. The jersey was uh, upcycled. Everything was found fabrics. If you see the little sculptures on the floor, they were by a friend, um, Jordan Tinker, who basically covered cuddly toys in clay and fired them up. So inside of those little sculptures, I always wanted the space to be a creative space and to collaborate with artists and other creative people. So that was it was very experimental. So these are the shapes in the beginning. Uh, a circle, a triangle, a rectangle. And as you can see, depending on where you put the armholes or the neckline is how it's gonna drape on the body. And also I wanted things to have as, as few seams as, as possible. So it, become, it became very much about the drape and the woman's body creating that drape. Okay, so this is the circle top on the left and the triangle top on the right in fuchsia pink jersey. Um, some of my sketches, original sketches, 
you see, and a lot of it was, I was always drawing circles and, you know, geometric shapes and I would see how things would drape, you know, on the top right hand corner, you see a dress uh, that's basically uh, cut in one piece. It's just one piece of fabric, which in the end, you know, she has it, it's backless, she, the girl's dancing is wearing, she's, she has a bare back, but that, there's a zipper that closes it at the back and the, the head goes through the top so basically it looks like a poncho on the back so and then on the left of where it says scrapbook this uh, one piece dress that was just literally one piece of fabric that draped around the body it had one seam um this is the orion dress which basically i wanted it to be two circles sewn together and it's a very a chicken scratch sketch and I'd sort of figure out how to do it on my sketch and then I gave it to my pattern cutter and he was like no <laughs> but he did it in the end he would always say no too difficult too difficult <laughs> you know this was the Orion dresses um from 07 and then it got repeated on 18 I'm forever going back to my own archives I don't get inspiration from other people um and that's what we keep doing now. Uh, this is, oh my God, this is, I opened this store in 98. I think this is all stuff that you guys already heard. Um, so the Cooper Hewitt, and then we won the Sustainability Award Fashion Group two years ago, which was a major achievement because Caring had won it the previous year. So for us as a small company, get yeah, that recognition has been really great, actually. And the eco swimsuit that we used to do, we don't do that anymore, but um, we also work with um, eco cashmere, which means that, means that we um, work with the ends that get left over on the floor and they get rewoven into spin into a new yarn. And we're made in New York mainly, so we got the made in New York certification. And what else can I put here? Uh, was New York brand ambassador for Privy, uh, which is Premier Vision, is the the biggest fabric fair in the world, which all the designs go to. And uh, I think my favorite collection was the one down at the bottom on the left, all in white, which is basically 2017, and everything was done with eco drape, and so nothing was colored, everything was in white, and the girls looked so angelic, which I really loved. There's a fancy picture of me receiving the Sustainability Award from our friend, Matt Ruffalo, which is very funny because he gave the best speech ever. Aww. Uh, and, you know, we have a candle, which is all my favorite scents put into one thing. And I love that candle because it reminds me of the places that I love, where it's Dea or Hydra, the Mediterranean, and figs and pine and all those beautiful smells. Oh, okay. Oh God, this list. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, wow. Sorry, I just, it's, it's, it's weird for me to talk about myself like this. Okay, awards and recognition. Okay, Maria becomes a member of CFDA. <laughs> uh, I got the Cooper Hewitt Award in 2006. Uh, and I went to Washington. Then 2008, we won the CFDA Award for Sustainable Practices, and then the CFDA Lexus Eco Challenge Award winner, Ooh. the Sustainability Committee, the CF oh God, CFDA Lexus, the Fashion Group, and I'm on the board of directors of the CFDA now. With all you are the so you are so celebrated. You should be so proud of yourself. Is, it, is this your question about imposter syndrome? I was thinking, I always go, is it me? <laughs> maybe, maybe. So <laughs> let's explain to the audience that one of the questions that I didn't ask in the end, but now Maria is referring to was about, you know, how we feel sometimes that we are a fraud, that we don't deserve all this recognition, which we call the imposter syndrome. So the question was about advice that she would have for us um, to overcome the imposter syndrome. So it sounds like it, Maria, yeah, but tell us about your experience. 
because it, it feels like, yeah, you, you, you said you're an introvert. You don't like to have the attention on you. Now you're looking at all these recognitions, uh, how the industry and beyond as have been celebrating you and you feel like, oh, but no. So tell us about that. Um, you know, it wasn't part of any master plan. So like I said, I only worked, uh, my goals were to be creative, to have a business, to be able to sustain my family, to create a community. And, you know, my, I shouldn't really say this online, but my parents are total socialists. <laughs> So I was brought up, you know, basically, like I was saying, I, I never wanted to be in politics or anything like that. But I think it's like I keep saying, it's about cause and effect and trying to show by example how you can move the needle. And you can only move the needle by being within, you know, and little by little you can change people's perceptions and influence. And so it's it's always been done in a, you know, somebody said to me, PR, very big PR company when I first started said to me, well, um, so how are we going to do this? And I said, um, well, can you just make it interesting that I'm a female designer that have children and have a life? And I'm doing, I'm working and I'm a, and I'm, I'm a creative designer. And the minute I said that I had children, she, and he said to me, it's going to take a long time. <laughs> So anyway, it's just people's perspectives. And, um, you know, for me, it's also like cause and effects and just, I mean, I'm always really humbled by the people that pay me compliments because I feel like I've worked at this for so long. And, you know, I have a team and over the years, you know, it used to be just me and one other person and the team has grown. and. And and now you know it takes a village because the, the company is bigger and and sort of um, and whenever I say you know even where it's Vogue Runway I said they they oh we did this print and then immediately they print Maria did this print I said no I said and I had said no we did this print because of course I work on the design I'm still here every day I influence the way things look but I'm not literally doing every piece myself and it takes a village. So, you know, and most designers make you think that they just sit there doing it all themselves, but they don't. I mean, as the company has grown, so has the team. And, and that to me is also part of community and how do you also shine a light on, uh, on the people around you? Yeah, so clever. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, do you want um, to sure. do you want to continue walking us through? Yeah, this last yeah. and then we're going to move on to audience questions. OK, so this is OK. Just so you know, this Hyundai uh, did this partnership in 2019 where we upcycled the car leathers left over from their cars. And literally, you see the picture on the left with the models. And so it's basically upcycling our fabrics. And then we applicate leather onto, there was either a jacket with applicated leather or denim that you see, or there's the pockets on a dress. So it was basically about upcycling with Hyundai. And then for 2020, last August, in the middle of COVID, I went to Kiev to film this commercial for their electric car. Uh, as they had asked me to be the ambassador for the campaign, you know, also with the UN for sustainability, um, which was pretty amazing because I flew during COVID, there was only 15 people on the plane. <laughs> and in those days when you're flying during COVID last August, it was luxurious. There was nobody at the airport. I was the only one in first class. And I miss those days because it was so quiet. <laughs> For an introvert, it was actually really nice. Um, anyway, so they built this set and it was a fun excursion. I went there literally for two days. I was quite mad, actually. <laughs> then, um, as you see, we produce locally. We reuse leftover stock. I always believe that if we create things that are timeless in design, uh, then you will keep them in your wardrobe forever and they will make great heirlooms. I hope my goal is always to pass things on and for my clothes to great, create great vintage pieces or heirlooms. 
This is the Fall Winter Collection, which is in the store right now. And on the left, you see the eco denim jumpsuit, the flight suit, and then the jacket. And then we have the red is basically the top that I'm wearing today. Um, it's the eco drape. And this was shot at the Navy Yard, but inside because it was cold. <laughs> this is Capsule, which is coming into the stores very soon. And we collaborated with his friend, artist Magda Sayev, who's from Austin. And she does these amazing crochet balls and she covers everything in crochet, whether it's a wall, a sofa, a car, a skateboard. And basically uh, the print was inspired by her art and the colors in the collection. Uh, what else? This is spring summer, which is right now we're in the middle of wholesaling. And the whole idea behind spring summer was the idea of rebirth and a butterfly, a chrysalis. And I had just come back from holiday and I said, I just want it to feel sensual and like we're coming out because it felt like things were opening up again. And there's me again, women want clothes that make them feel good, that they love and will want to wear time and time again. And I think that's when we approach, when, when I hear that from women, and they say, you know, my wardrobe is mainly you because everything else doesn't feel right. It just makes me really happy. Of course. So this is it for now. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for, you know, spending all this time talking to us. And I would love now to go to the audience questions. So we are going to be looking at live questions. Uh, from the audience who is with us live. And we have the first question from Guest Cafe. And it's, what are your thoughts about clothing rental services? For example, Rent the Runway. <laughs> is this comparatively better for the environment, less in landfills or worse? More shipping, carbon emissions? You know, that is a loaded question, which <laughs> I've done the math to tell you, but I, uh, the idea that you can rent clothing and then you won't be, uh, you know, people won't be producing anymore, but they're renting things that are already existing to me is good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the shipping, I mean, we're all going to hell right now because of shipping, because between Amazon and COVID and the fact that everybody's getting everything shipped, it's bad. Uh, so unless people start walking to a store and going into retail and buying physically in a store again, uh, whether it's rent a runway or even us, you know, we have people that live around the corner and they order online. Is the, do you, is the in, but do you think the industry is paying attention to this uh, shipping issue? or you don't yes. see yeah. enough, we, yeah? We know for a fact that we try and do things like when we're waiting for fabric to arrive, we sort of cons consolidate into one shipment, or, you know, even for when we're shipping out to clients, we say we'll send it uh, by road, which is, you know, lower impact. And then, you know, it's like we'll consolidate the shipment, but, you know, and we also put everything in compostable bags but the reality is, is unless people start walking into a store and mm -hmm. literally buying things, everybody's getting things shipped. And so that's what, not what, clothing. It's what, Yeah, absolutely. So Everyone. what do you say to these uh, rental services? Thumbs up or thumbs down? <laughs> I think it's good. I think uh -huh. it's good because I think a clothing should not disappear into landfill just because it's not the season. Yeah. I think it's the right sentiment that is basically saying you can rent this, you can wear it for three weeks, but then it won't go into a landfill. And then it won't be also uh, energy being used to produce again more stuff. You know, I yeah. think that's the thing is how do we minimize uh, uh, the cause and effect, you know, what we're doing to the planet. And I think we all have to do what we can in every way. Yeah. Let's go to our next question. So this is from Shuba Lyer. What is your strategy to transition to a sustainable wardrobe and do this quickly and in a cost-effective way? 
Well, I think sustainable is trying to make the most of what you already have in your wardrobe and sort of edit it down to things and pieces that you love and buy only new things that you really love and that are produced sustainably, like our collection or, you know, whoever it is. But I think um, it's good to also look in our own wardrobes and go, okay, I have all this already. How do I make this look modern again? Or how does it, how can I style it out? You know, I think it's, it's going back in our own wardrobes and adding interesting pieces that will make it sustainable, interesting pieces that will refresh it all. But I wouldn't start from scratch because that defeats the object of the exercise. Yeah, so you would transform what you already have, and then if yeah. you want to add new pieces, add the sustainable pieces, uh, yeah. and be more, more aware of yeah. the brands you buy, their, their history, how they produce, do they produce locally? Yes, and also with, with washing, you know, we don't need to wash everything every single day. Uh, just wash things once a week that you've really worn, or, or you know, I think all those things matter. It's like with me, I, you know, line drying instead of, you know, using a dryer. I think every little bit helps, you know? Yeah. Okay, let's move on to our next question. So this one is from Jose Martinez. What was your inspiration for your new spring summer 2022 collection? I think I sort of answered that. I think the idea of a chrysalis or a butterfly coming out from COVID and the fact that I, I wanted things to be uh, lighter and feel that there's a sense of rebirth and newness, uh, Jose. I mean, to me, a butterfly is quite symbolic. So, you know, the jackas were made with a butterfly, the, you know, and I think it's, um, people responded really well because we did them with uh, eco cotton and recycled polyester, the jackas, and yes. Okay, let's go. We can cover one more question and then we're going to wrap up. So next question from the audience is from Aura Carolina Castillo. What are some of the metrics, characteristics that environmentally conscious consumers should look for in a clothing brand? Um, I think uh, local production, wherever possible, materials being eco, recycle, you know, there's a lot of recycled fibers now. Um, but also buy something that you really love and you keep and you wear and wear, you know, because I think that's the secret is not to keep buying, but to buy smarter now. People are going to keep consuming. But I think, uh, you know, some of these clothes need like passports because they've been around the world to arrive here. So I think it's check your labels, where things are made. And, you know, because I think that's one of the biggest things is the carbon footprint. That's what about uh, what about organic cotton? Um, well, you is, know, is it okay if it says organic and it comes from anywhere or you think, no, that's not okay? I mean, we use organic cotton. I mean, it, Cotton is consumes a lot of water. So it's eco, but it consumes a lot of water. So I think you have to look at, okay, maybe uh, certain things I need to be in cotton, whether it's underwear or things that go close to your body. But other things, if it's a raincoat, buy a recycled polyester, yeah. nylon, buy something that's been recycled, or even like the fleece, Patagonia fleece materials things like that. I think it's just thinking about, you know, what do I really want to be cotton? What do, because cotton is a, it's a big thing, you know, and like with us, with our eco denim, we don't do any treatments on the, on the denim. It's not, it's, it's the natural color or mm -hmm. it's organically dyed with, you know, leftover waste. Like we have olive right now, which is an eco denim earth color. And I think it's like when you start buying those denims, which have rips that have been acid washed, all that goes into the environment. It goes into the polluting the rivers. It goes, you know, in yeah. India, they have an environmental disaster because a lot of the production that China doesn't do anymore 
they come to India because there are less restrictions. So we're polluting their water. Mm -hmm. So we can wear an acid wash pair of jeans with three reps on it. Rip it up yourself. Yeah. Your yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, you can start with some bleach to bleach it. I don't know. I mean, I just think all these uh, denim is like one of the worst pollutants because of all the treatments that it goes through. Yeah, no, and, and certainly we need to uh, start becoming more and more aware of you know the clothes we wear, how they were produced, yeah. where they were produced. So thank you so much for sharing all that. So we are going to wrap up, and I have one last question for you in the next. Uh, four minutes that we have left. Um, so we, you walk us through this amazing journey that your personal life and your career have been. Um, what is the one dream that you feel is yet to come true for you and Zero? Uh, my next big dream was to do a lifestyle store where I could design the furniture, the interiors, the fabrics, um, you know, just so beautiful, like nice yeah. Yeah, and is it is it part of like your five year goal or <laughs> one year goal? <laughs> I think my one year goal is to do an artist residency. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably more than five year goal. Fantastic! Thank you, thank you so much, Maria, for being with us today. Thank you for sharing your story, for sharing with us your approach to sustainable fashion and for opening up. And um, I hope that all our audience have enjoyed this conversation. So thank you everyone for tuning in. And yeah, receive all our love from uh, Talks at Google in partnership with Ola, Google's Employee Resource Group for Latinx and Hispanic. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you so much, Maria. Thank you for having me. Of course. Bye-bye.